Well, you can join me in opening your Bibles to John chapter 4. And if you don't have a Bible with you, you can grab one under seats nearby. And John 4 is on page 888 in those Bibles. And if you don't own a Bible, uh, please take that one with you and keep it. We'd love for you to have it. We're continuing a sermon series called People for the World, and we're seeing how God saves us to show and share the love of Christ with others. So we do this both in our words and with our works. So we show Christ's love with our actions, and then we also share Christ's love by speaking about Him through what we call evangelism. The word comes from the idea of sharing good news. So evangelism isn't popular, but it is an act of deep love. It's sharing the good news about Jesus. And if you are a Christian, you'll notice that everyone is an evangelist for something. Everyone gets excited about things, promotes, encourages people to get on board with things. We're all evangelists for what we love. If you are a Christian, you have the greatest news to share with people. They may not yet think that it's great news, but the way that they come to see it as good news is through this beautiful, mysterious, miraculous process of you sharing it with them and God opening their eyes to see Jesus as we just sung and prayed. And so we know that the God who made us loves us. And though we've all rejected Him and rebelled against Him, He sent His Son Jesus, who lived a perfect life, died on the cross for our sins, rose again as King, is even now loving and interceding for us, and will come again to renew all things. And the good news is that He's accomplished our salvation, and anyone can get in on it by trusting in Jesus. You give your life to Him. You put out your empty hands of faith, and you receive His forgiveness and grace. You receive your eternal future, and you follow Him. You give Him everything that you have, not to earn this salvation, but in response to it. And so, everyone whom the Lord saves, He then sends to share His love and show it. And so, here's what we're going to see this morning evangelism, sharing this message that I just summarized for you. This is not only an act of love toward others, it's an act of nourishment for yourself. Or think of it like this, many of you may be unfulfilled in life and not know why. You know Jesus, you're growing in Him. And so you do have your deepest needs met, and you have this deep sense of fulfillment from Him. And yet, in some ways, you often sometimes feel apathetic or depressed or purposeless and unfulfilled. One of the reasons I want to show according to Jesus is, could be this, that you are not intentionally seeking to share Christ with people. You aren't participating in Jesus' mission for the world. Jesus fulfills us both by meeting all our needs and being the one whom our soul desires, and He further fulfills us as we see other people come to have their needs met in Jesus. So, in John chapter 4, Jesus shows us that part of a fulfilling life is doing the work of evangelism. So, if you read the stats at how few Christians do this, it also could explain our general sense that many Christians seem purposeless, meandering, and pursuing superficial pursuits in life. Mission is a meal. We are spiritually nourished and strengthened as we show and share the love of Christ. So, so many of us may often feel spiritually famished, unfulfilled, meandering in life, you may be in a season now or sometimes enter into seasons of apathy, irritability, selfishness. One reason may be that you don't know Jesus. You may think you do, you may say you do, but you don't actually know Him as the Savior who meets your deepest needs. You're not satisfied with Him. But another reason may be that although you know Him, you are not living fully aligned with His purpose. You aren't eating this meal of mission. So let's read this story here. We're going to be jumping in, uh, not so much in the middle of a story, but in the aftermath of a story. So, Jesus has encountered a woman at a well, and 
I had a hard time thinking about what to share this week because I really wanted to talk about that a lot more this morning. I did about 10 years ago, so I don't know that many of you are here or you remember this. So we'll come back to it um, because there's a lot to say about this whole chapter. We're going to jump in in verse 27 after he has this encounter with her. Verse 27 to 45. Just then his disciples came back and they marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we've heard for ourselves, and we know that this indeed is the Savior of the world. After two days, he departed for Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for your word here, and we pray that you would open our eyes to see the beauty and wonder of Jesus afresh, and that you would convince us more deeply than maybe we've ever been convinced before that your mission and the work of evangelism and spreading and sharing the good news of Jesus is for your glory, for others' good, and for our own joy as well. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus here invites us to participate in the work of mission by seeing that it's like harvesting. That's the idea that he gives us here. So this is what he calls evangelism here. It's harvesting. So what is that? Well, we'll see the characteristics of harvesting here, the satisfaction of harvesting, and the expectation of harvesting. So characteristics, satisfaction, expectation, that's where we're headed. So first, characteristics of harvesting. Harvesting. So our text comes in the aftermath of, the, of a very famous story about Jesus. If you haven't read the first half of the chapter before, it's been a while, I uh, encourage you to go do that this afternoon and maybe multiple times this week to get a picture of what this harvesting looks like. So there's this story about Jesus with this woman at a well. He has this conversation with her, and he's just invited her to trust him. So Jesus himself was doing the work of evangelism, or what he's calling here, harvesting. So we're coming into the story right after Jesus has done that work with her, and the disciples had been sent away to get food, so they weren't there for this conversation, and now they're returning, and they see Jesus talking to this woman. And this is now verse, verses 27 to 28, so you can see it with me and see what happens here. Just then his disciples came back, they marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek, or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, and then she goes on and shares what her experience was. So the disciples return with food, and they see Jesus talking with a woman, and they're shocked by it. In talking with this particular woman, Jesus is crossing, and in their minds transgressing, social, ethnic, and gender barriers. Their culture had several strong walls that separated people. Jews didn't talk with Samaritans. Samaritans didn't talk with Jews. Men didn't talk with women in public like this. Certainly not a teacher 
like Jesus. And she was also socially outcast and marginalized in her own town. And so they're shocked. But something's happened in this conversation because the woman goes and immediately goes back to her town and tells the people about Jesus. So how did Jesus evangelize here? And then how does the woman go and evangelize or harvest here? So here's five characteristics we'll see. We'll just look back at the story of Jesus with the woman and then look at what the woman does to see five characteristics. The first is love. Jesus loved this woman when nobody else did. She was at the very bottom of the social standing, even of her own town. That's why she's out there getting water in the middle of the day, in the heat of the day. That is not when women would go get water. They would go in the cool of the day and often in community. So she's alone at the worst time of day because she's by herself, likely because she's an outcast. We find out from the conversation that she has a reputation for going through one man after another. And the disciples are shocked because no Jewish teacher would be talking with a woman like this. But he loves her. And he knows she needs grace and needs him and needs his salvation. And so he speaks with her gently and kindly and patiently, demonstrating sincere love toward her. And that's a mark of true evangelism. You don't limit yourself to befriending and talking just with people like you or people that you like being with, or people that you're comfortable with. Jesus is our model. To live like Jesus is to go outside of your normal comfort zone, to not just wait for friendships to develop around you and relationships around you with people that you enjoy, but to go out to speak to and befriend people that especially are rejected by others. So everybody is made in God's image. Everybody needs to know Jesus. The second mark is truth. So Jesus gently spoke the truth to her and addressed sin in her life. She had five previous husbands. The one she's living with is just another man. Jesus didn't bring this up to shame her. He didn't scold her. He brought it up to show and give an example of in her life where she was seeking satisfaction where it can't be found. She has an idol in her life. He brilliantly connected with her longings, understanding what drives her, and makes her tick, and then redirected her longings to himself. So he talked with her also about what she believed and where she was seeking fulfillment. He gently challenged her to show her that it doesn't work, finding her longings in relationships and men and with her syncretistic religion that she had as a Samaritan. He offers her living water. She drinks this water, trusting and knowing him. She'll never thirst again. She'll be satisfied in knowing, trusting, following Jesus. So, in other words, what we see Jesus do here in in holding truth and love together is uh, the opposite of what our culture expects people to do. So, our culture, and I've said this a number of times, I'll just keep bringing this up because it's really helpful for us right now. Our culture has conflated love and affirmation. So, if you love someone, you have to affirm what they believe and say, that's great, that's true for you, and that's fine, and you affirm anything they desire and how they live as long as they like it and they're not harming anyone. And if you say that there's objective, true truth, then you are viewed as a bigot or as trying to be manipulative or have a power play in a relationship. This is why many people think that evangelism is arrogant and why many Christians have begun to think that evangelism just does not fit. And it's, it comes across as arrogant. And it's because of this assumption, they assume that evangelism, evangelism is saying, I'm right and you're wrong. But evangelism is really saying, Jesus is right, we're all wrong. Right? It's, it's pointing to Jesus. Evangelism is ultimately about, ultimately about sharing the good news that Jesus alone satisfies. So Jesus helps this woman see that the satisfaction she's seeking in men isn't working for her. And we see that all around us, so many of the desires in this call to follow your heart. You do you. That's your truth. It's not working. We're in a generation where people are convincing themselves that this is how to live, and people are beginning to see this, but we're not open to say it yet much publicly, that it's not working. And Jesus has a gentle conversation with her to, to show her it's not working for you and you can find your fulfillment in me. So he loves her enough not to affirm her current beliefs, 
He loves her enough to show her truth. He exposes the emptiness in her life so she could fill it with him. So the woman trusts Christ and becomes an evangelist in her town. And we learn the next mark of evangelism from her. It's joy. So we have love, we have truth, and then from her now we see joy. Verse 28. So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all I ever did. Can this be the Christ? So she's found living water in Jesus. So she leaves her water jar. I think that's an intentional note that John's pointing to that's charged with symbolism um, of her saying, I found the water I need. I don't need to fill this jar right now. She's satisfied with Jesus. Then she goes and tells about Jesus. That would have been uncomfortable for her. She likely did not have many accepting relationships in that town, but she's so filled with joy that she spontaneously goes anyway. Maybe you've thought before, I don't have the gift of evangelism. I'm not good at this. But I don't think we have to conclude that she had the gift of evangelism either. She just had the gift of salvation, and she had a joy and a love for people to tell them. You don't need the gift of evangelism to tell people about Jesus. You just need the gift of salvation to make you so filled up with joy and love for others that you can't help but thoughtfully and kindly find ways to tell people about Jesus. So if you haven't talked to someone about Jesus in a long time, and maybe just think here right now, if you're a Christian, when was the last time you had a specific conversation with someone who didn't know Jesus about Jesus? And how great he is. What the cross and resurrection mean. Could it be that if it's been a long time, it's because you have lost your joy in knowing Jesus. You're not drinking of the living waters like she just did. Filled up with him to overflow. If that's the case, then step one for you is not just going to share the gospel, but it's to delight in Jesus again to see him as wondrous, to commune with Father, Son, and Spirit through his word, to bring all of your sin before him, and just confess it afresh to him if you've not confessed sin to him recently, or there's unconfessed sin in your life, and receive again the joy of salvation. And now what does she say? Well, the fourth mark is testimony. We tell our personal testimony. She says, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. She has humble transparency here. Here she's drawing attention to how she's had this encounter with Jesus. She's experienced him. She's changed because of him. And then later in the story, down in verse 39, we see that many of the people believed because of her testimony. Every Christian has a personal testimony to share. A testimony is a witness. It's bearing witness to how Jesus has saved and changed you. It's the story of how you've come to know and trust Jesus. So if you're a Christian, you have a story. And so I encourage you to, if you, if you haven't thought through how to articulate your story, just even very concisely, so you're ready to share it with someone, uh, do that. Write it down. I found even in talking to Christians over time, um, just, and I've had conversations with many of you about this, just a great thing to do is ask each other how we came to know Jesus. And one thing has struck me over time that with a certain significant percentage of believers, when I ask them to tell me their story, they start telling it to me and they start tearing up because it's so meaningful to them. But there's another reason why they start tearing up. Several of them say, it's been a long time since I've shared this with anybody. And so it's deeply meaningful for them to even remember how the Lord has brought them to himself and transformed them. And so, that's just a reminder that, that we should be ready to share the story. Tell the story to one another and to those who don't know Jesus. We have everyone who goes through our Discover ZF class do this. Just learn to write out your story in short form. It helps you get ready for those conversations. Clarify for your own life how the Lord brought you to Himself. And so, the woman's story here is pretty brief. She came to know Jesus. She knew that He was the Christ, and she invites others to see him. And so that leads to the fifth mark, which is the most important one, and that's Jesus. We invite people to know Jesus. Do you see what she says in verse 29? Come, see a man who told me all I ever did. Could this be the Christ? She's inviting them to explore Jesus, to get to know Jesus and see for themselves. That's the heart of evangelism. It's not 
inviting people to understand merely the morals and the ethics of the Bible. It's not just inviting people to have an experience at a church service. It's not just inviting people to enjoy Christian community, like you've got to meet my friends. It's, it can involve all of that, and it often does and should, but ultimately it is inviting people to know Jesus. So this is actually what makes evangelism easier because it takes the pressure off you. You don't need to be the expert. You're not winning them to your personal philosophy of life. You don't need to overcome all their objections. You don't need to know all the answers. You're on a journey of knowing Jesus yourself. You're inviting people to come along with you to know the real Jesus. And as they have questions and you don't know the answer, you can say, I don't know. Let's figure that out together. Let's explore Jesus together. And God's given us in His Word, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the stories of Jesus right there. So many people become Christians, not just through conversations with Christians about the gospel, but by reading the gospel story for themselves. So give people a Bible if they don't have one and encourage them to read the gospel of John, this one, this very here, and offer to meet with them to read the Bible together. Read a couple chapters at a time and just talk about it and let your questions mainly be, what do we learn about Jesus here? What would it mean to follow him? Who is he? What did he do? What what attracts you to him? What repels you from him? So Jesus is the heart of it. So those are the characteristics of harvesting. Love, truth, joy, testimony, Jesus. Now, second, the satisfaction of harvesting. After the woman leaves to go to her own town, Jesus gives a fascinating lesson. Jesus sent them away to get food, and now they've returned. Jesus would no doubt be hungry at this point. But look at what he says. They want him to eat. Jesus starts talking about a different kind of food. This is verses 31 to 33. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. Which I can't help but as like a dad who's raised young children say, like, I've said that a million times now. Son, eat, eat, finish your… Okay. Okay. Uh, But he said to them, that was distracting, sorry. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? They're thinking, he's full. He sent us to get food. Did someone bring him something? We're asking him to eat. He's talking about different food. They're confused. They have no idea what he's talking about. Verse 34, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. What's going on here? Jesus just used the water metaphor with the woman. Now he uses a food metaphor with the disciples. While water represented the satisfaction and joy of knowing Jesus, now the food represents the satisfaction of sharing Jesus with people, the satisfaction from evangelism, from harvesting. It's the sense of fullness that comes from seeing other people drink the water. Do you see that? So the woman came to the well looking for water. She was thirsty. Jesus says he has a water she doesn't know about, a water that would fulfill her deeply, infinitely more than water from a well. It's the living water of knowing Christ. She drank that water, and she's going to tell others. Now the disciples come, like the woman looking for water, the disciples come offering food, and Jesus says, I'm already full. He has a food they don't know about. It's the meal that's more satisfying. It's the meal of mission. Do you see how Jesus put it? He said, my food is to do the will of him, the Father, who sent me, sent me on mission here, and to accomplish his work. And what's the work that Jesus was sent to accomplish? Not just obedience in general. In this context especially, and in the Gospel of John, it's the work of bringing salvation to people. It's the work he was doing in this conversation with this woman. And then he explains evangelism as harvesting. He says, do you not say there are yet four months and then come the harvest? So, sowing, sow the seed, you wait four months, then the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. They're ready. The harvest refers to gathering people to Jesus. Jesus says, look up. Look at the people. They're a crop and they're ready to come to me. They're ready for harvesting. And what would the disciples have seen if they looked up right there? Well, the woman just told the people of her town about Jesus and now they're coming to him. 
The disciples, I think we can assume, would see the people from Samaria starting to come out to him. That's the harvest. And then Jesus explains this in terms of sowing and reaping. So some people sow, other people reap. It's a process. There's no guarantees that every single person you share Jesus with will respond well. And it could be that they, you're just sowing seeds right now and then someone else harvests. Maybe you'll befriend someone, talk to them about Christ, and then 40 years down the road, someone else will talk to them about Jesus and they'll harvest. Or maybe you'll share the gospel with, with someone and it will click because for 20 years they've had someone else in their life that has been talking to them about Jesus at different times. God's in charge. We're not. But some so others reap. I remember one of the most encouraging stories in my mind from this. I couldn't locate this, so I may find this and share it again soon. But I remember reading in the 1700s about someone who became a Christian way old in age while they were working on a fence in their yard because the Lord recalled to their mind, I, I think it was something as they, when they were a child, what their mom taught them, or maybe a sermon that they heard when they were a child. It was just lodged in there sitting for like 70 years and then converted, sowing, harvesting way later. So never lose heart there. But if you're a Christian, the point here is, is this, the process is happening. Jesus is saying the harvest is here. It's, there's fulfillment and joy that comes from this. Get out there. So if you're a Christian, you've come to Jesus like the woman did for living water, but you may sometimes still feel spiritually famished. One reason may be that is that you've stopped drinking the water of knowing Jesus and, and drinking deeply from Him. You're using your career or your reputation or wealth or family as your source of deepest joy and contentment. And, and when those things are threatened, you get anxious and nervous because that's your real source of joy and it's not working. You need to let Jesus be your source of living water. But it also could be that you are satisfied with Jesus, but you're not yet eating this food. And this explains why you feel spiritually purposeless, or perhaps why certain patterns of selfishness are developing in your life. You're focused on yourself rather than Jesus' mission. Jesus is offering here water and food, and He wants us to drink and eat both. Jesus never meant uh, Himself to remain your personal Savior alone. He sends you on mission. You need both water, the water of worship, and the meal of mission to be satisfied. Christina and I have learned to identify the seasons in our life when this is missing because we can see the symptoms of it. Sometimes we'll just have a few days in a row where you know, I'll just feel kind of irritable. We'll just kind of turn on each other. Let's we'll be quickly bothered about things, be a little bit more depressed. And we've learned to ask the question over time, well, hold on. Why are we this way? And we found it's often in a season when we're not intentionally seeking to make disciples. We're not trying to invest in other Christians to help them follow Jesus more, using our time intentionally to do that. Or we're not befriending our neighbors or other friends or family members to help them know Jesus. We're not intentionally taking steps to bring Jesus to people. And then we found, okay, let's invite some people over. And then we do, and we're filled up with joy again. We weren't eating the meal of mission. So maybe you feel like that. You, you get irritable and selfish, and maybe one of the reasons is just get off of yourself. Turn your eyes outward. Look at the harvest and start eating. And you can do this even as a family, too. We need, you know, if you're a parent, your children need the gospel. They're your harvest. But what we can often also do is start to draw a little circle around our family and then get turned in on ourselves and become selfish as a family. And rather than looking outward on mission in our neighborhood and workplace and community. So be thinking about the harvest and living on mission. What intentional steps do you need to take to start bringing in people and harvesting and eating? And when you do that, I think you'll find what I found, joy returns, because we're made for this. Jesus is putting the meal in front of us. But you may be thinking, but what can we really expect? Our culture seems to be declining People aren't interested in Jesus. It's awkward and hard. We can't change people's hearts. I've tried before. Doesn't work. What can we expect? And I think the answer is more than we might think. So third, the expectation of harvesting. Jesus gives this picture of some people sowing the seeds and other people harvesting or reaping. 
So it makes us think about this process, right, of people coming to faith. Some people sow the seed of the gospel. Later on, maybe years later, some people harvest and the person comes to faith. It can take a long time. We have to be patient. Now, that's true as a principle. But Jesus is actually radically changing that expectation here as kind of a default expectation of what to expect. He says the harvest usually comes a long time after the sowing. But he's saying that's changing now. A new era is dawning. Sowing and reaping are happening almost simultaneously. The harvest is ready. The fields are ripe. It's time to gather. Look at verse 35. Do you not say, there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see the fields are white for harvest already. The one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. So again, this he says, says to look up and they're seeing the harvest. And then verse 39 says, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. And when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed two, two days and many more believed because of his word. So he's saying, look, the harvest is ready. And then a bunch of people over the course of a couple days come to faith. A revival happens in Samaria. Now the background to this, like so many of the things Jesus says, is a metaphor from the prophet Amos. Amos 9.13, in that text, God had promised that one day a new era would dawn, the new creation would come, the renewal of all things would happen, and that day would be marked with creational abundance and fruitfulness. Amos describes this surprising scene of like a sower out in the field dropping seed in, and then all of a sudden the crops kind of popping up and the harvesters gathering, they're out there just rejoicing together because it's so fruitful. Everything's ready. It's flourishing. And Jesus is saying, the new age has dawned. It's here. And so, using this as a a metaphor and a picture of people, he's saying the kingdom of God has dawned. The new creation has come. And so, the era of waiting is over. This is the era of harvesting. It's ready. And so he applies this to evangelism. There's a massive shift in the history of salvation happening with the coming of Jesus there. Before Jesus came, just think of what the world was like, what was going on over here and where Zionsville now is, right? Hardly anybody knew the true God. Most of Israel didn't seem to know the true God, let alone the nations that were in darkness. Then Jesus comes and the Samaritans who did not know the true God all of a sudden are coming to know him. And then from there, the gospel spread after Jesus' resurrection, and the gospel's been spreading for 2,000 years. So that w- what's happening now with the, you know, us sitting in this room worshiping Jesus, it's because the harvest is here. The harvest is spreading. Some, it's ebbs and flows in more some places and less than others. There's still places it has yet to get to go, which is why we pursue global missions, because there's a harvest and a crop that we need to gather in, and no one's gone there to harvest yet or to sow and reap. But the day of harvest is here. So Jesus is introducing this new era. He wants us to have, this is the point, big expectations. Because it's about what he does. But now you may be thinking, okay, but right now in our culture, our society, it feels different. People are resistant. Well, for one thing, a lot of people are less resistant than we think. I mean, if you just watch the news, you get the sense everyone's all polarized and angry at each other. But you talk to real people, people are very open. In fact, there was one study that recently showed, I think it was something like 80-some percent of people said, who weren't Christians, said that if a Christian friend of theirs invited them to come to church, they'd be happy to go. I think if you ask Christians what they thought that percentage would be, they'd be like 3%. Nobody wants to. But people are actually befriend them and invite them the vast majority are happy to come. And then let's, let's be ready and open for this. Um, let's always remember, I give this reminder from time to time, it's been a while, that we don't have assigned seats. You don't get to own your seat, right? So if someone comes in is in, is in your seat, your first thought can be, Lord, thank you for placing them here and get to know them. And I know some of you do a great job. I know um, Uh, One couple talks about moving neighborhoods, right, in this room. Just move neighborhoods every once in a while. Just move where you sit and meet new people. Meet new people at our church and befriend guests. So just always have this mindset that this is a place for people to come to the well of knowing Jesus. 
and let's always be open to this. But also, yes, there are things that are problematic in our culture. People do seem to be less open to Jesus in some ways. Okay, but couldn't the disciples have said that about Samaria? Pagan syncretistic, picking and choosing what parts of the Old Testament, rejecting the rest. And yet, look, a conversation at a well sparked a revival. The great awakenings of the 1700s spread across Europe and the colonies, and it came in a time of incredible godlessness and darkness. George Whitfield had to preach to thousands outside, not just because there wasn't room in buildings, but because those who owned the buildings, the leaders and pastors, didn't want him in there because they weren't converted. They didn't want anything to do with this. So the alcohol addiction was rampant at the time. People didn't have a clue about the real Jesus, even those who went to the churches. And yet the Lord in that time of darkness shined light. And we're living in the wake of those revivals now. So what do we think about our nation right now? Well, we're in the midst of a cultural revolution around gender and sexuality and family structures, and those are clearly at odds with the teaching of the Bible. And so people have to adjust on those things after they come to follow Jesus, they're going to figure out very quickly, okay, this, my whole life has to be reoriented around him, and he has things to say about these things that I didn't like. Well, a fewer and fewer in the younger generations are then identifying with Jesus or any church. So what do we expect here? I don't know, right? We don't know what will happen in our nation, but we can still expect a harvest. Tim Keller wrote an article a few months before he passed away titled, American Christianity is Due for a Revival. And here's what he wrote. I love this. There was no reformation until there was. There was no revival that turned Methodists and Baptists into culturally dominant forces in the Midwestern and Southeastern United States until there was. There was no East African revival led primarily by African people that helped turn Africa from a 9% Christian continent in 1900 to a 50% Christian continent today, until there was. Christianity, like its founder, does not go from strength to strength, but from death to resurrection. There will be no revival in America until there is. So let's go with expectations. You still may think, but what can I do? My life is so small. Well, look how the revival in Samaria there started. This woman with no social standing encountered Jesus. And in her joy, she talked to the people about her story and invited them to get to know Jesus. And the revival was sparked. So let's not be content with small hopes. Yes, you may be weak. Yes, our culture looks dark. But God loves to use weak people to shine light in dark places. So, a couple final implications. Uh, First, learn to identify the symptoms of being famished. Meaning, learn to identify when you are becoming perhaps selfish selfish or irritable or purposeless, and, and let that be an opportunity to just confess that to the Lord and repent, and then get on mission. Get to know people. Befriend them. Share Jesus with people. Ask you or you or or your family if you sense you're becoming maybe self-focused. And brainstorm together how you can be outward-oriented to show the love of Christ and share it. Eat the food of mission. Second, view yourself as a harvester in the fields that God has placed you. God has placed you in several relational spheres or fields. Those are each little fields. Your neighborhood is a field. Your workplace is a field. Your sports group or your hobby relationships are a field. Your classmates in school are your field. Your extended family is your field. If you're a Christian, Jesus has saved you and placed you there sovereignly and providentially as a worker in that field to bring in the harvest. You may be the only Christian that those people will ever meet who sincerely loves them and will share with them about Jesus. So view yourself this this way. Use your renewed imagination to see reality clearly that you're in a harvest. Third, get to know especially lonely or discouraged or rejected people. Just drawing this from the implication from this text, Jesus is for everyone, but we see in this story 
He goes especially sometimes toward the outsiders. The Samaritans were rejected, and he went there. This woman was probably rejected even by them, and he went to her. He cared for her. He got to know her, and it led her to faith. Most evangelism will happen in the course of everyday friendships in life. But don't be afraid of striking up conversations with people you don't know. That's what Jesus did here. Get to know new people. View them as potential friends and future believers. Fourth, find natural ways to talk about Jesus. It's often hard to talk about Jesus if you're only talking about superficialities in life. So sometimes we have the people that are closest to us that we talk deeply about things in life, and then people that we're not as close with, we say superficial. But you can go deeper. Just ask questions, be a curious person, ask people about their purposes in life. Ask people about their hopes, what they're looking forward to over the next few years, their desires. Pay attention when they note disappointments and kindly ask about those and share your own disappointments and hopes and desires. And when they, when they do return the question to ask you about your purpose for life or your hopes, your desires, just be transparent. Don't hide the thing that matters most to you. Just say, now this may sound weird to you, and then you can just share. Just, you know, I, I had an encounter with Jesus um, I was con- I'm convinced that he really did rise from the dead and he's changed me. And so I believe he's coming back to renew everything. And so though my back has all these problems and I'm asking him to heal it and it's frustrating, um, one day he promised to give me a new body um, and go from there. So find natural ways to get to Jesus. Fifth, be ready with your own testimony. The woman was ready to tell people about her encounter with Jesus and we should be too. So if you've never written out your testimony, just Take some time and write it down. It's usually just three parts. Who you were before you encountered Jesus, how you came to know Jesus, and how he's changed you since. And be ready to share it with people as part of your story. And then finally, invite people to explore Jesus. This woman said, come and see. Come see this man. Come see Jesus. You don't need to be an expert on Jesus to invite people to come see Jesus. This woman had lots of questions left, but she's able to direct people to Jesus. You just need to be willing to help people explore him. So one of the best ways to do that is to just encourage them to read the Gospels. Maybe give them John Stott's book, Basic Christianity, or Tim Keller's book, The Reason for God, and invite them to meet and talk about it. Don't assume that they like everything they read. Just say, I'd love to hear your response. Maybe things bothered you. I'd love to hear that. Um, and talk about it together. So there is a harvest. We're placed in the midst of it, and we have great expectations for the Lord to work. What might He do? Let's pray. Father, thank You for this great privilege of causing all of us to be born in this time and place, in the midst of the harvest age. And so we pray that you would help us to believe more deeply in our identity as harvesters, as your people called to be sent on mission. And we pray that you would surprise us. Surprise us with how you work through us in our weakness, with what feels like such a small step of courage can often be heroic, and we pray that you'd use that and empower us, and you do the things you can only do, which is giving new life. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.